okay, flashback, it's like 2016 or something, and dumb stupid idiot teenage me is having a really big think. I'm thinking it's time to lock in. I need the cool alternative girls at my school to notice me. I can't just be this loner who watches anime all the time. It's not working out. I don't like it. And one day I'm in the library and it hits me. I gotta become more erudite. I gotta become more scholarly. And I see a collection of books by Edgar Allan Poe. Ooh, this might do it. So I started reading and immediately got enraptured by the writings of Poe. William Wilson especially stuck with me. I don't know why that one. Uh, I also really like The Fall of the House of Usher and The Raven, but then I got to this other story. It's called The Murders in the Rue Morgue, and it's a detective story, so immediately I was like, okay, like I like detective stories, this could be good. And then it turns out the whole thing was done by an orangutan who wanted to be a barber? And then I looked it up, and it turns out this is considered like one of the first works of detective fiction? That's crazy. That's just insane, so I need to talk about it. I need to bring this to people's attention. Edgar Allan Poe's weird orangutan story that invented detective fiction. So I'm gonna run through the entire plot because it's just bonkers and then talk about the literary impact of this work because it's actually quite important. It's just insane. So yeah, given that most of my following comes from that one time I talked about hopeful horror, Thanks for that, by the way. I now want to talk about horror that is so utterly surrealist, it's just funny. Um, but like an Edgar Allan Poe story, not Funhouse Massacre. Literally immediately in this story, we get the introduction of a detective classic, which is the story being relayed by a normal guy narrator who is following around some tortured, dark academic detective. Paris. In Paris it was, in the summer of 1840. There I first met that strange and interesting young fellow, August Dupin. Dupin isn't actually a detective because that's not really a thing here. He's just kind of this weird eccentric rich guy who hangs out at bookstores and studies people and when he asks the police if he can help out with a murder case they just say yes. In terms of his detective method he's very similar to Sherlock Holmes in that they just kind of observe people more than evidence. In fact, in the very first Sherlock Holmes story, A Study in Scarlet, Watson directly compares Dupin and Holmes, and in several Holmes stories he employs similar tricks to the ones employed in the stories of Dupin. And I just gotta say here, Sherlock and Watson shippers, who were very disappointed by the BBC, get into this story. Literally page one, the narrator asks Stupin to move in with him. He just is that interested by him. Quote, I was surprised too at how much and how widely he had read. More important, the force of his busy mind was like a bright light in my soul. I felt that the friendship, friendship, of such a man would be for me riches without price. I therefore told him of my feelings towards him and he agreed to come and live with me. Rest in peace, Edgar Allan Poe, you would have loved AO3. <laughs> For the rest of this first part, Dupin doesn't do that much. He just showcases how good he is at reading people when the narrator has a thought, and Dupin goes, yeah, I agree. And then the narrator's like, why is he agreeing with me? That was just a thought I had. Is he a mind reader? And Dupin's just like, no, like, I just know what you're thinking. You're very easy to read. Um, and then we cut forward to the summer of the same year where some murders have happened in Paris and Dupin gets involved. So what we get next is three and a half pages of newspaper. I'm going to read all of it and pretending I didn't tell you what happens right at the start because it was very funny. What do you think happened here? <laughs> Would you ever guess that it was an orangutan? Paris, July 7th, 1840. In the early morning today, the people in the western part of the city were awakened from their sleep by cries of terror, which came, it seemed, from a house in the street called the Rue Morgue. The only persons living in the house were an old woman, Mrs. Elise Spanne, and her daughter. Several neighbours and a policeman ran towards the house, but by the time they reached it, the cries had stopped. When no one answered their calls, they forced the door open. As they rushed in, they heard voices, two voices, they seemed to come from above. The group hurried room to room, but they found nothing until they reached the fourth floor. There, they found a door that was firmly closed, locked with the key inside. Quickly, they forced the door open, and they saw spread before them a bloody sickening scene. A scene of horror. The room was in the wildest possible order. Broken chairs and tables were lying all around the room. 
There was only one bed, and from it everything had been taken and thrown into the middle of the floor. There was blood everywhere, on the floor, on the bed, on the walls. A sharp knife covered with blood was lying on the floor. In front of the fireplace there was some long grey hair, also bloody. It seemed to have been pulled from a human head. On the floor were four pieces of gold, an earring, several objects made of silver, and two bags containing a large amount of money in gold. Clothes had been thrown all around the room. A box was found under the bed covers. It was open and held only a few old letters and papers. There was no one there, or so it seemed. Above the fireplace they found the dead body of the daughter. It had been put up into the opening where the smoke escapes to the sky. Chimney. That's, that's a chimney. The body was still warm. There was blood on the face and on the neck there were dark, deep marks which seemed to have been made by strong fingers. These marks surely show how the daughter was killed. After hunting in every part of the house without finding anything more, the group went outside. Behind the building they found the body of the old woman. Her neck was almost cut through, and when they tried to lift her up, her head fell off. The Murders in the Rue Morgue, Paris, July 8th, 1840. The police have talked with many people about the terrible killings in the old house on the Rue Morgue, but nothing has been learned to answer the question of who the killers were. Pauline de Bourg, a washwoman, says she has known both of the dead women for more than three years and has washed their clothes during that period. The old lady and her daughter seemed to love each other dearly. They always paid her well. She did not know where their money came from, she said. She never met anyone in the house, only the two women lived on the fourth floor. Pierre Morau, a shopkeeper, says Mrs. Illy Spane had brought food at his shop for nearly four years. She owned the house and had lived in it for more than six. People said they had money. He never saw anyone enter the door, except the old lady and her daughter, and a doctor eight or ten times, perhaps. Many other persons, neighbours, said the same thing. Almost no one ever went into the house, and Mrs. Illy Spane and her daughter were not often seen. Jules Mineur, a banker, says that Mrs. Illy Spane had put money in his bank beginning eight years before. Three days before her death, she took out of the bank a large amount of money, in gold. A man from the bank carried it for her to her house. Isidore Musée, a policeman, says that he was with the group that first entered the house. Whilst he was going up the stairs, he heard two voices, one low and soft, and one hard, high, and very strange. The voice of someone who is certainly not French. The voice of a foreigner. Spanish, perhaps? It was not a woman's voice. He could not understand what it said, but the low voice, the softer voice, said, in French, My God. Alfonso Garcia, who is Spanish and lives on the Rue Morgue, says he entered the house but did not go up the stairs. He is nervous and was afraid he might be ill. He heard the voices. He believes the high voice was not that of a Frenchman. Perhaps it was English, but he doesn't understand English, so he is not sure. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to skip the next two paragraphs because basically they get an Englishman in who says, no, I don't think that's English, it's maybe Italian. They get an Italian guy in who says, no, it's not Italian, I thought it was French. And then the loop just goes on and on forever. We just don't know what language this guy's speaking. Anyway, back to reading. The persons who first entered the house all agreed that the door of the room where the daughter's body was found was locked on the inside. When they reached the door, everything was quiet. When they forced the door open, they saw no one. The windows were closed and firmly locked on the inside. There are no steps that someone could have gone down whilst they were going up. They say the openings over the fireplace are too small for anyone to have escaped through them. It took four or five people to pull the daughter's body out of the opening over the fireplace. A careful search was made through the whole house. It was four or five minutes from the time they heard the voices to the moment they forced open the door of the room. Paul Dumas, a doctor, says that he was called to see the bodies soon after they were found. They were in horrible condition, badly marked and broken. Such results could not have come from a woman's hands, only from those of a very powerful man. The daughter had been killed by strong hands around her neck. The police have learned nothing more than this. A killing as strange as this has never before happened in Paris. The police do not know where to begin looking for the answer. Gang? Steve? It looks like we have a real mystery on our hands. Sorry to any potential French viewers for completely butchering your language. Leave an angry comment because that's actually good for me. <laughs> but yeah, at this point, this story is so compelling. Before Dupin even gets involved, we have so many clues. The fact that the family were very secretive and no one knew where they got their money from and they took it out just a few days before the murders. The fact that none of the money was taken from the house and the only things that seemed to be really out of place were some old letters. The sheer violence of the crimes and the fact that one was potentially committed with bare hands and one had been so forceful that a woman's head could come off. 
and the fact that in the span of five minutes, people arrived on the scene, heard two people, one French and one from God knows where, in the room, but by the time they'd got up there, they hadn't seen either of the two leave, but the room was fully locked. There were like no entrances or exits. Dupin gets very excited by this when the narrator says it's a mystery, but I don't think it's possible to find an answer. Dupin says, no, I think you're wrong. A mystery it is, yes, but there must be an answer. Let us go to the house and see what we can see. There must be an answer. There must. And from here, the story just goes off the rails. So I'm going to put on the funny clown music and let's just get through it because this is just insane. So Dupin and Y slash N enter the apartment. No one stops them. There's no one there. It's just been left exactly as it was in the newspaper. So, you know, blood everywhere. And Dupin immediately figures out that the windows are automatically locking. Seemingly, no one who lived in the area has similar architecture. None of the police officers figured this out. But yeah, the windows lock themselves. So if you climb out the window, then shut it behind you, it's locked. It appears to be locked from the inside. There you go. That's how they escape. And then Dupin does that really annoying thing that people who make Sherlock video essays talk about, where he just says, ah, I figured it out, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> he goes, I've cracked the case. But I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you the answer. Y slash N, you don't get to know. And then the narrator is like, well, we're on the fourth floor. So how did they get down? And Dupin's like, oh, they climbed down a lightning rod. <laughs> and the narrator's like, that doesn't make sense. Like, you would need to be an Olympic gymnast to do that. And Dupin's like, or an animal. <laughs> And then Dupin says, okay, we've figured it out. This person has done so much overkill and stuff is really bad. They have a inherent wildness, less than human. What have I helped you to see? And then this is the actual text. A cold feeling went up and down my back as Dupin asked me the question. A man, someone who has lost his mind, I said. A madman, a madman. Only a madman could have done these murders. I think not. In some ways, your idea is a good one. But madmen are from one country or another. Their cries may be terrible, but they are made of words, and some of the words can be understood. Here, look. Look at this hair. I took it from the fingers of the old woman. The hair of the madman is not like this. Tell me what you think it is. Dupin, this hair is... This hair is not human hair. So then the two start talking about the hand marks around the neck of the girl, and the narrator says... Dupin, these marks were made by no human hand. And Dupin says, no, they were not. I am almost certain they were made by the hands of an orangutan. One of those man-like animals that live in the wild forests. The great size, the strength, the wildness of these animals is well known. Now, look at this book by Cuvier. Read, look at the picture. He just has a book on orangutans on him? At all times? He brought this with him to the crime scene. How could he have possibly known he would need that? And then your name, the narrator, whatever, is saying, okay, what about the second voice? And Dupin goes, it must have been a sailor because they're the only people who A, are strong enough to climb down a lightning rod and B, capable of getting an orangutan? Fine, whatever. And then he pulls out a newspaper extract about how an orangutan had been caught and a sailor is trying to get it. Sure. And then Dupin turns around and says, you can come in now, and a sailor just walks in. Bearing in mind, it's still a crime scene, there's still bodies on the floor, blood everywhere, and the sailor just says, hey, are you the guy who said you had my monkey? <laughs> And Dupin's like, yeah, I've got it in here, come in, come in. And the sailor comes in and Dupin pulls a gun on him. So the sailor freaks out and just starts expositing orangutan lore and then says his orangutan escaped and was really into watching him shave. So he believes he, it wanted to be a barber. So then Dupin just goes to the police station, has this sailor confess, and that's the end of the story. Huh? Huh? It started so good. And then it just turned into this, what, what, is, what? The fact that this story even exists is wild. The fact that it was written by Edgar Allan Poe is insane. And the fact that it went on to directly influence the creation of Sherlock Holmes and detective fiction as an entire genre, 
what? It like, huh? How did this lead to Knives Out? Poe biographer Jeffrey Myers says that this book, this story specifically, changed the history of world literature. And he is kind of right. Like, Arthur Conan Doyle took elements from Dupin and turned them into Sherlock. And a similar thing happened with Agatha Christie's Poirot. They are both loosely based on the character set up by Dupin. The story itself may be completely nonsensical, but this came out when crime was something that people were being a lot more conscious about. As stated in that little note earlier in the video, the first detective agency had been set up just before this, and later there would be proper detective um, work being available for people in Boston, London, various other places. So it was relevant? To an extent, I, I don't know how many people were getting killed by orangutans. Someone find the statistic for me and let me know. And that's it for me. I've covered the funny <laughs> orangutan story. Um, I did want to say thank you for helping me get to 500 subscribers. If we can get to 1000, that'd be great. So, you know, do whatever to get the algorithm going. Hopefully one day I can have my dream of having enough money to purchase an actual microphone <laughs> and not just speaking through like a potato. <laughs> the support specifically for the horror content has been great and I really enjoy making these videos in part because I actually live next to a graveyard so whilst I'm making them I can look out and you know the vibes are there. Alright cool, see you around.